we go. Yes, so when we're talking about electric vehicles, uh, many times the discussion is synonymous with electric cars, as we've already heard a few times today. So I'm kind of here to make a point that there's another player with quite a lot of potential um, that is uh, often overlooked, which is the, uh, electrically the electric bicycle. Um, it's not a new one. It's been around really since the 1890s. I didn't include some nice pictures, as you did, John, uh, of those early ones. But really, it's like the electric car. They've only taken off in the last decade or so. Um, and there's a very uneven landscape of how popular they are globally. So in some European countries, uh, mainland European countries, such as Germany, the Netherlands, they're very popular. Um, those of you from those countries know all about it. Uh, they're also very popular in China and other Asian countries. However, in some other countries, such as the UK, they are not very popular, and many people have absolutely no idea what they are. So for those of you who don't, I've got this slide here, talking about different types of e-bikes, because it's also really important to distinguish between the different types of bikes. They're often brought together in discussions, and I would argue that they are quite different types, and it's really important to be precise about that. So what they have in common is that they are a bike, that they have a motor, and they have a battery, as you can see, see on the top left. But as you can see already from the images, you can have all sorts of different configurations of them. They can be folding bikes, they can be cargo bikes, they can go really fast, and they can have different modes of pedaling and assistance. So for example, uh, there's a group of bikes called Pedal Assist, Pedelec, or Assisted Bikes, which I'll mainly talk about today. They are like a normal bicycle, you need to pedal, and you can have additional assistance if you wish. But when you stop pedaling, the assistant cuts out. Um, that's very different to the throttle controlled or twist and go bike that you see in the middle, uh, where you can have the assistance without pedaling. So it's more like a moped style bike, really. You can pedal, but you can also go without pedaling. And then on the right, we have the electric scooter or moped, which is basically a normal scooter or moped, which runs with electricity. Um, so really important to always be careful which type you're talking about, because for example, with the electrically assisted bike, you're still getting the health benefits of doing some pedaling, even if it's easier, and when you switch it off, you have obviously a greater health benefit. Um, all of them, you can charge up without needing a specific infrastructure like cars do. So they usually just plug into the mains and you can charge them like you would charge your phone or laptop. Um, are they sustainable? Um, always depends how they, what kind of electricity they're charged up with and what kind of battery they use. I won't go into detail, but if compared with a car, the uh, CO2, CO2 emissions uh, certainly look a lot better. This is based on doing a round trip 200 days a year, 15 or five miles a day. Uh, and the little green bit is the e-bike bit, and the big one is the, the car uh, CO2 emissions. Um, there's been some research done that in many urban areas, e-bikes are faster than cars for trips up to nine kilometer, and that cargo bikes are the fastest alternative for um, goods up to 100 kilograms in urban areas. Um, the global e-bike market uh, is growing. Um, for 2012, projected sales are about 30 million units. The vast majority of that is happening in China, so it's about 83 to 92% of the overall market. That is largely twist and go e-bikes that are more moped style than pedelecs. Uh, whereas the units sold in Western Europe and in the US are much more the pedelec style where you have to pedal to get the assistance. And that's mainly due to the different legislation in those countries. Um, this is a growing market, um, so the projected growth rate between now and 2018 is 7.4% global, and for Western Europe, 11.8%, so there's a lot happening there. And uh, just to say that Asia and China is on a completely different scale than the European market in terms of the size um, that you can see on here. Um, now, not only cars, but also bicycles can be shared. We all know from the London Boris bike scheme, and you can see an illustration of that uh, in the bottom. Um, they've been integrated uh, with charging stations. They've been integrated with other modes of transport, for example, with the Deutsche Bahn in Germany. 
and there are all sorts of ways how they're integrated to intercities in interesting ways that you can check out. Um, now I wanted to mention um, the project I'm running uh, at the University of Brighton. Uh, it's the Smart E-Bike project where we're specifically looking at how we can use electrically assisted bikes in the UK context and we're using mobile media for monitoring and feedback to riders. Um, and we're especially interested to encourage people who don't currently cycle. So we've bought uh, 35 of these uh, Raleigh electric-assisted uh, bikes. Um, they are also a project partner. We've put a monitoring system on all of them with Android phones and yo-yo boards and sensors. It's all open source. Other projects can use the same system. And we can collect real-time data about the usage of these bikes as we give them out to different trial participants. So we know exactly how much they use the bikes, how much assistance they use, and we can attach, attach all kinds of other sensors. And we can give real-time real feedback to everyone riding the bikes and participating in the trial. And this is a really important part of it, that we use the kind of mobile media infrastructure and the bikes together. Um, I've got some early results for you from the first trial that we ran this year with a Brighton-based insurance company um, where uh, 20 people took out the bikes in the early summer and another 20 in the late summer. And uh, what is really promising is that we are managing to actually get people into cycling that did not previously cycle to work, people commuting. Uh, we, we got some people that did 450 miles in 10 weeks uh, that did not previously cycle to work, so that was a really interesting result. And a lot of people had very emotional responses to riding these bikes because it's just more fun if you can go faster uphill or against the wind or overtake all those people in Lycra and not <laughs> breaking a sweat. Um, now, um, people are also reporting that they're saving time and money by using the bikes. Um, and a sort of side effect that's not really part of our project, but they are also reporting uh, impact on health and well-being, that their heart rate goes up, that they get a workout, and that they do a lot more exercise when riding these bikes. Um, and it's interesting to mention that actually using the bike still fits in with the guidance on physical activity and the NICE guidelines that came out last week in terms of moderate exercise. But really the bit that I want to end on, if that's okay, is the uh, integration of media into this. So I think it's really key to understand this not necessarily as a fleet of bicycle, but much more as an internet of things. So each of these bikes is collecting data in real time. We can have sensors about pollution in the city, about people's heart rates, about all sorts of other things going on. And that can be shared with everyone else riding these bikes in the city. So what we are developing now is that people can share their ride data with others and they can put it on Facebook and all of that. And of course, people are obsessing about their stats and the quantified self and all of that. Um, so we are tapping into that. Um, so um, I would say in the, in the spirit of speculating about the future, that uh, if we think more about e-bikes and possibly less about electric cars, uh, that we could have multiple benefits um, of high density, they take up a lot less space than cars, of reducing carbon emissions, of meeting physical activity guidelines, of decreasing traffic noise, they are obviously silent, uh, and to really integrate communication networks into this mode of transport at an early stage um, to collect data about usage and how we can take it further. Thank you. Rainer, is this a competitor? No. No? And, <laughs> and, and why, why not? I mean, your, your cars are small. They're not necessarily to be used to transport your big family yeah. goods or anything. Um, we have also heard about cargo bikes. Okay, you can't fit two people, but uh, you get fit by using it. Yes, uh, that's great. Um, but, you know, as I said, we believe in the, in the whole system. And uh, as I, um, we have, for example, a cooperation in Düsseldorf, one of our locations with the Next Bike, it's a German car, uh, bike sharing company, uh, and together with public transport, where people buy a, a monthly ticket, which includes uh, hours driven with a bike sharing program and minutes driven with car to go. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, as I said, people decide from situation to situation. If it's raining and I have lots of bags in my hands, I probably don't want to take the ride sharing program. 
but I might want to take the bus or want to take the, the car sharing car. Uh, in summer, and this is, you can see clearly see this from our numbers, uh, of course people prefer the bike because it's nice and warm and makes it's fun to, dri to ride a bike. So um, people are really flexible. I think the secret only is they don't have this car in the garage anymore, which forces them to take it every day because they've paid it anyway. So um, apart from this, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I think this is the future. Otherwise, I mean, I can't get people into only my cars uh, if, I, if the people don't have alternatives like the bike or the bus or the train or a taxi or whatever. Mm. Now we'll stick to the theme for another five minutes. If there are people in the audience who want to make a comment or want to ask a question, please indicate in a moment. Uh, I see that already. I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Frauke, another question I have, and, and I guess obviously anyone who is already cycling would, would ask this. Is there a, not a danger that we are seeing uh, e-bikes replacing conventional bikes? I and the question, whether we see any evidence whether that's already the case. Um, I would say that's probably different depending on the cycling culture that you already have in different countries. And it's really important to be specific about that. Um, but what we are trying to focus on in our project is to engage people in cycling that do not currently cycle because they are being put off by going uphill, they are being put off by having a lot of wind along the seafront, for example, in Brighton. People that don't want to arrive sweaty at work. So all these kinds of reasons um, putting people off cycling or they are afraid that they might run out of steam um, and they can now use the assistance. So I'm, I'm sure there will be some people who switch or who extend their cycling careers later on in life, for example, by doing so. But we are mainly interested in getting people to change their mode of transport towards cycling. We had a question from the audience, but please. Yeah, um, I'm Ben Proud and I'm Director of <coughs> Strategy for Surface Transport and Transport for London. Mm. Uh, and my job is to encourage people to take up more conventional tra transport uh, uh, over and above the rail network. It fascinates me that in a conversation about post-car cities, we've talked almost exclusively about new forms of cars and electrically powered bicycles. If you look at cities around the world that have encouraged sustainable patterns of movement, they've done three things. Really good mass transit, walking and cycling using the, the, the quaint old manually powered bicycle. And I think it's a real mistake to think you've got to start with the uh, alternatives to existing car technology. That's a very important part of the package. But you've got to do those other three things first, not least because the technologies are available right now at a very significant mass scale. So you've got to be clear about where you start. And I wouldn't start uh, with electric cars, critical though they are, as part of your wider mix. Thank you. Any further questions I, I see here? Judy, I see, yeah, please, at the end of the, and sorry, can we have a microphone at the end? And then there's the one here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I, I'm um, Judy Wise from Henrietta. So there were two things really. I mean, one thing is I've often heard this um, figure about young people not getting their licenses, and I, I wonder what the explanation is, and if there's anything to do with huge youth um, unemployment and poverty and things like that, that, that youth, that it's not a choice actually, it's to do with, you know, the state of, you know, the economic uh, position of youth at the moment. The second thing is I just wanted to um, pick up Philip's point about the family car and things. And one of the things I remember very um, early in the green movement was, you know, that it's very much parents with young children who are trying to take kids round and um, shopping and all sorts of things who had lots of conflicts with early um, green politics that were anti-car. And I just wondered what the demographics are. I mean, you know, making it fun and the sort of pictures and all the images we've got here seem to be of single people. And I just sort of wondered about that, if, it, if there's any thought um, being given to, to different situations and different demographic groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Are you willing to take one? <coughs> yes, uh, thanks. Um, uh, the, the first point about uh, younger people and uh, driving licenses is inter interesting and of course it is hugely affected by current prolonged period of austerity but of course this period of austerity looks like it's going to go on for a long time and so it might be actually pretty uh, setting, in, setting in place a particular pattern. There are also surveys that ask people wh what you know, young people do you want a, a, you know, the latest smartphone or a, or a a second-hand car or a car, and they, they, they increasingly say, so you've, you've got this data now over quite lengthy periods that say 
uh, I haven't getting, I'm not getting a license, <laughs> and I see, and I prefer um, uh, a smartphone rather than a car. It's, it's sure, it's, it's in highly interpretable data, but it's kind of interesting. I think that the question you also say about uh, families is interesting because, of course, the car is never just a means of individual transport. It's also moving objects, and of course, this brings out the sort of materiality of lives that are lived partly in and through uh, the car, and of course, moving other people, dependents, and so on. So one of the things will be important in all of these will be how is it that uh, luggage and objects and uh, materials and small people and elderly people are also moved. And uh, so, the, so one of the things that implies is the diversity of forms that these vehicles, whatever we call them, are, are going to take. And we shouldn't have a single size, I suppose. I'll take one more question from uh, Thomas, please. Yeah, uh, looking at it from the consumer's perspective, I have a question to Mr. Becker. Um, you probably have done some research on how the average city dweller uses his car. And if you compare that with the cost he would have to um, spend for the car to go, how does that compare? Um, we have done some calculations, of course, based on, on examples that we came up with. I think it's a very much looking at the individual uh, situation. Um, first thing is, I don't want someone to replace their car with car to go once again. Uh, I, I don't want someone to sell their car and then use car to go only. I want them to go into the tra transport system. So at the end, the calculation you have to make is uh, someone sells their car and instead let's say uh, 10 times a week uses uh, the, the, the bus, uh, twice a week uses a taxi, and uh, once a week uses the rental car, and then maybe twice a week, which is an active customer in our statistics. An active customer drives twice a week and not 50 times or something a week. Um, a car to go, and then at the end of the month you draw the line and you see what the costs are. And if you use the public transport a lot, if you use the bike or walk a lot, and then use a car from time to time, at the end, uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the calculation will be better than have owning your car and getting into it every day. I think just if I can add this quickly to, to also to this question, when we buy a car, I mean, we start with, um, okay, uh, I go to work with one car, my, my husband goes to work with this car, and uh, then one has to bring the children away, then suddenly the car has three places. And then we need to go to the grandmother on the weekend. Oh yeah, then we need four places because we go all together. And then we go on holiday sometimes. Okay, the dog also has to be in. So it's five, uh, five places at the end. And the car is huge. And we take the car every day because it's there just to go to work with one person. So um, the flexibility which the whole transport system ne uh, gives us helps us also to, to avoid unnecessary space that is consumed all the day just to, to justify some event that come every, every I don't know, two weeks or so. Thank you. I, it's time to move on, and we'll now focus on uh, intervention in space. Uh, and the first and most obvious candidate is our home. And a lot of discussions have happened about how to smartening up our home. It's one of these areas where probably we're most skeptical. Uh, and over to Kent Larson uh, with his experience at MIT in revolutionizing our house. Thank you. 